Good morning, everybody. Uneducated economist here. So I thought I'd talk a little bit more about this uh, sovereign debt crisis that I think we were going to experience around the globe. And it's pretty interesting, some of the articles that I'm coming across. Now, I'm going to leave one down, down in the description for you guys. And it's talking about the issuance of debt that China has done and how it is that they are handling the defaults coming from some of these nations. Because this is pretty interesting to think about. Like, a lot of people don't realize that when nations around the world, nations and corporations, when they issue out debt, a lot of times they will issue out that debt in U.S. dollars, meaning they're borrowing in dollars and they're due back in dollars. These are U.S. dollars. And it doesn't have anything to do with the United States. It doesn't have anything to do with our corporations or our government. Or it doesn't have anything to do with the United States at all, the Federal Reserve, nothing, right? But they were able to get the best deal, these nations and corporations that are outside of the United States. They're able to get a better deal by doing the doing the bond sales or however they're going about it in US dollars. Now, when you think about what a bond is, a bond is just like any other loan out there. It's a contract that is due back at a certain time in the future, plus an interest rate attached to it. And these bonds, they carry a price to them, right? So you have like, you know, a bond in your hand. Now, most of them are electronic now, but if you can imagine you have a bond in your hand, it has a face value to it, it says $100 across the top of it. And at the bottom of it, it has 10 coupons that are each worth $10 when they become mature. So that was like a typical bond back in the day. Now, most of, like I said, most of these are now electronic. You don't actually get the bond itself. And you don't really tear off coupons and go and cash them in. They just automatically get deposited into your accounts. So bonds are something that can be sold and traded, and they carry a value to it as well, not just the face value, but then a price tag that goes with it. Because somebody says, hey, I really like that bond, I want to own it. And you're like, no, I don't want it. Well, I'll give you more than the face value for it. I'll give you more than what the next guy will pay for it. And so there's a price tag that goes to it that can go up and down. Now, when you have a sovereign debt crisis or a corporate debt crisis, those bonds or those debts that are due fall in price. I mean that they're like, you know, they might have a hundred dollar face value to it, but the chances of that nation or that corporation paying it back have dropped so much that the idea that you're going to even get your hundred dollars is very minimal. So you're taking on a lot of risk. So you're like, well, I don't care how much the face value is and really doesn't matter how much the interest rate payments are. If the place defaults, then, you know, what difference does it make? Because you don't get your money back. So that hundred dollar face value bond, I might give you 20 bucks for it. And because the person who owns it is like, man, well, it's better to have something than nothing, they might actually sell it for 20 bucks. This will cause the yield on those bonds to go way up. The price falls, the yield goes up because it still has a face value and an interest rate to it. If that nation or that corporation happens to pay it back, well, then you just got a really good deal because you picked up this bond for 20 bucks, but it has a hundred dollar face value plus all the interest rates interest payments that are going to come to it and the nation that was in question actually doesn't default and pays back its debt or restructures them and you have to take what they call a haircut you know where you or a a haircut is actually a little different um but a bath i think is probably what they more talk about it where you do not get all the interest payments or all the face value back from those bonds and the restructuring of them so if you can imagine this is kind of the process what happens with these corporations and these nations that start going into default is that they can't pay these bonds back and what do you do to the bondholders or for the bondholders or how do you deal with this now most of the time these creditor nations around the world they they have what they call the Paris Club. And now I knew about the Paris Club, but other than reading the Wikipedia page on it, I, I, it didn't give me much more information than I already knew. And it sets when these crediting nations out there, the ones who have issued out all this, all this loans, they generally, when a nation goes into default, then they get together and they say, okay, well, how are we going to handle this default? Are we going to restructure it out to a longer term? Are we going to write off some of the debt? They, you know, figure out what they're going to do for these nations that are, that are defaulting. Well, China is not playing that game, right? China has issued out a lot of this debt or issued out a lot of this money. They issued out debt too, but they issued out a lot of these loans, basically buying the, the bonds from like, you know, Sri Lanka and Pakistan and all these other places. 
and then also investing into the Belt and Road Initiative where they loan money to, you know, build power plants or whatever that is that that's going on in those nations. And I believe we actually covered that on a Pakistan story. Um, but anyway, this is what China has been doing over the last, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever it is. They've been lending out all this money all over the world and they're doing it in U.S. dollars which is really interesting to think about because as the monetary policies here in the United States try to deal with the inflation scenario that we're experiencing, that is creating a drying up of the dollars. It's the liquidity coming out of the system and that is creating pain all over the world. And you can, ex like I said, with Sri Lanka and Pakistan are great examples of this because they're heavy in the news right now. And so as these dollars are now coming out of the system and these nations are having more difficult time trying to get the dollars in order to pay their debts, they're starting to move into a defaulting period, defaulting scenario. And China is not restructuring or they're not wanting to restructure. They're wanting them to pay up or give up, right? So this is where the power plants, the ports, the natural resources of these nations end up coming in more control of China. And that is a really scary scenario when you think about how much control they already are taking and how they are expanding their, their efforts around the world. Now, granted, there is a lot of problems taking place within China, but I think China is one of the few places that is quite okay with dealing with the pain. I mean, their people have gone through misery for quite some time and they are well aware of economic collapse and crashes and hardship and everything that goes with it. So I think China is very much on board with creating some debt crisis issues going around the world. And you can just kind of see it within their own nation with Evergrande and how their property developers are basically going into default right now, creating a crisis scenario with their property. And that in turn has created some like serious mortgage protesters out there, which is pretty interesting to think about all on its own. Because like in China, like the uprisings get get hammered quickly by the government, right? So you can't protest in China. There's no way you can do it, at least not on the streets, not, you know, you can't go out there and I mean, you can. There, I mean, it happens. But for the most part, most protests get get squashed pretty quickly by the government. But when you have a protest like is happening now with the mortgage boycott, that's something that they can't really control. Like, how do you how do you deal with that? And people just simply just give up paying their mortgages. Now, it does make a lot of sense on why they would give up paying their mortgages, because they're paying mortgages on apartments. A lot of these Chinese people, sorry, these mortgage holders, I guess I should call them because they don't even have property. You can't call them property owners because the building doesn't even exist yet. And a lot of these people are like really frustrated with the whole idea that they're paying mortgages on a building that doesn't even exist with a company that may go into, into default. It was just like, why even make any more payments on this thing, which is causing the problem to get even worse because you think about it, all these future projects that all these people are paying mortgages on that don't exist yet, waiting for their apartments to happen. Those are assets of Evergrande and, you know, the other property developers out there, not just Evergrande, but everybody out there who has promised to build these things and are taking payments for it. That is part of their assets that are now starting to dry up even more. So it's like, how do you even function any further if you can't even get the payments for the future projects that were, you know, it's like the P robbing Peter to pay Paul. So you can kind of see how this protest is pulling back on even even more like assets that n causes the liability shift on the uh, on the Evergrande corporations or the the property developers to grow even worse. So like as their asset prices or asset value falls because these people aren't may paying their mortgages, their liabilities increase and their credit rating gets even worse. That's probably the easiest way to say it. Kind of babbled there for a minute. I'm going to go to work. Uneducated economist, you guys let me know.